people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. Some passing thoughts on Ramla Ali's revenge win over Alejandra Guzman and what the coming year may hold for her, it being that she's literally campaigning in one of the deepest weight classes, one of the deepest, most talent-rich divisions in all of boxing. You know, I figured that Ramla Ali would be able to figure it out with Alejandra Guzman, but I noticed that immediately after the fight, she was holding a lesser version of a WBA title. And it just so happens that the full version of the title, the full version of the WBA title, will be contested very soon between Mayerlin Rivas, the champion, and Eric Cruz of Mexico, the challenger. I always figured the reason they put Ramla in there with Alejandra in the first place is because Alejandra would serve as a common opponent between Ramla and the WBC champion, Yemi Mercado. That's saying I always got the sense that the whole reason they made the fight is because they're looking to fight for the green belt. Even if there is a lesser version of a WBA title on the line, I felt like they were really going after the WBC and that's why they made that fight in the first place. I think the Yemi Mercado fight for what would be the WBC title, I think comparatively, that would be a more winnable fight than a fight with the winner of Rivas versus Cruz, Erica Cruz. I happen to think Erica Cruz is going to win that fight. I think she's going to beat Mayerlene Rivas, and when she does, she'll be WBA champion. And I don't think that Ramla Ali here and now is ready for the pressure, the power, and the volume that Erica Cruz brings to the table. I feel like those eggs need more bacon. That's what I think, and I think that if it's Ramla Ali's intention to fight for a title in either her very next fight or the fight after that, she'd be better off pursuing the WBC champion, Jamie Mercado, or the WBO champion, Sigaline Lafarve, provided that Sigaline stays champion after this year is over. Sigaline's got a fight coming up. She's supposed to be facing Ticey Gallagher. If she stays champion, Ramla Ali would be better off pursuing her, pursuing a fight with her, than a fight with the winner of Rivas versus Cruz, or a fight with Ali Scottney, her matchroom stablemate and reigning IBF champion. In terms of what fights are more winnable and what fights are more difficult, I feel like a fight with Ali Scottney, I feel like a fight with the winner of Rivas versus Cruz, those are the two more difficult fights for a title at the weight, whereas against Yemi Mercado, Yemi, who is more experienced than Ramla Ali, but noticeably slower with heavier feet. It's all relative because they're all difficult fights in their own way, just some being more difficult than others. I view the Mercado fight as a more winnable fight than some others, a more winnable fight for a title, because Yemi Mercado, she does have slower feet than Ramla Ali. She is slower than the punch. She is durable. She can take a punch. She went the distance with Amanda Serrano, and she is strong. Stronger puncher, punch for punch, than Ramla Ali, but she is also slower. Changed her methodology somewhat her last few fights. Yemi Mercado used to be more of a mid-range to inside brawler, but she's been doing a lot more boxing, moving, and punching. And if she tries to win a boxing match with Ramla Ali, who's more long and limber, a little quicker, I think Ramla can win a points decision. It's the area of opportunity for Ramla Ali, that if Yemi goes in there trying to play the boxer, she could drop a points decision. And what is the most winnable fight, relatively speaking. None of these fights are easy fights, you understand. They're not what I would describe as being easy. It's just that some are easier than others. And if it's Ramla's intention to fight for a title in her next fight or the fight after that, the Mercado fight looks to me to be the most winnable title fight that she can have. And let's see if she has it. So I do feel she's going to be fighting for a title soon. That's the title I think she should go after. 
In men's super middleweight news, the fight that's right around the corner, David Benavidez versus Demetrius Andre. David Benavidez says, I expect to stop Demetrius Andre. As David Benavidez is confident he will expose him. And you know, we haven't seen much of David Benavidez in the ring with southpaws like Demetrius Andre. That's interesting, as David is aiming to knock out Demetrius when the two meet in what will be the final Showtime pay-per-view main event this month on the 25th, where Benavidez will defend his WBC interim super middleweight title. I do expect to stop Andre. Okay. That's what he said about Caleb. I've been working extremely hard, Benavidez said at a media workout this past Friday. My last fight went the distance and I was upset about that. We're gonna correct the current mistakes and stop Demetrius Andre. And you know, pressure fighters like David, they don't really change much or improve much from one fight to the next. Usually they stick to what they know, they stick to what works for them up until it stops working. That's usually how it goes with pressure fighters. Now to David's credit, he does have a good engine, a better engine I think than Demetrius Andre. And even though I'm not completely sold on David's power, I do think he has more power than Demetrius, more at least than Demetrius. 26 year old Arizona a native isn't overlooking Demetrius Andre as a threat and says he will be ready for whatever comes on fight night. I'm preparing myself for the hardest possible fight. That's how I always prepare. I've been training three months and sparring 15 rounds at a time. I'm 100% ready to go. Intangibles we need to factor into the equation that David, David doesn't actually have much experience with southpaws like Demetrius, and that David, you know, he's been at this weight for a very long time. I don't imagine it's getting easier for him to make as he gets older and his body continues to fill out, becoming a man. He's a young guy. He's in his mid-twenties, believe it or not. His body is still growing. He's only going to get bigger. This weight is only going to get harder to make. And the relevance of that to this conversation in this fight is that even if Demetrius Andre isn't known for power, isn't known as a knockout merchant, if he's opposite the ring a guy who's drained, a guy who's killing himself to make the weight, well the punches might actually sting. And the angle of attack, remember, Demetrius Andre is a southpaw. When's the last time you saw David Benavidez in there with a southpaw? The angle of attack is important because that's the angle that the punches are coming from and whether or not you can see them, that has its role to play. So you could be looking at a weight drain fighter who can't see the punches coming for at least the first few rounds while Demetrius Andre is fresh. Demetrius Andre, who's good for a knockdown early. Perhaps he's not good for a knockout throughout the course of a fight, but it's not uncommon to see Demetrius drop his opponents in the early goings of a match. And David Benavidez is penchant for squaring up on his opponents, giving them both shoulders. He could get dropped early. And rallies back late. There is some things working for Demetrius, but one thing that's working for David is David has a better engine than Demetrius. Demetrius starts off strong and fades down the stretch, whereas David, David comparatively, has better cardio. And don't forget about the politic. We know who the banner, who the promotion is invested in. It's invested in David Benavidez more than it's invested in Demetrius Andre. And Demetrius not being a knockout merchant, him knocking out David is not likely. And he might need a knockout to win this thing because I don't think they'll let him win a points decision, even if he does enough to deserve one. So maybe the way it plays out is where Demetrius starts off strong and maybe he scores a knockdown, but fades down the stretch, gets outworked, and loses a points decision to David. Maybe that's the way it happens. I'm not fully convinced that David can deliver on his promise to stop Demetrius Andre when you couldn't stop Caleb Plant and he was exhausted. So I don't know that you stopped this guy, but you might outwork him. Win the rounds on volume. David Benavidez on points seems logical to me. As it pertains to that fight, Matchroom's Frank Smith had this to say, it's a shame it's on pay-per-view. It doesn't feel like it's a big enough fight and there's enough of a storyline between the two of them and they're not really going for it. I'd quite easily forget that fight was happening, really, and I agree, I've said it many times. Just because David wants a certain amount of money and Demetrius wants a certain amount of money doesn't mean it's justified, doesn't mean it warrants putting it on pay-per-view. In fact, 
Most fights don't belong on pay-per-view. Pay-per-view ideally should be exclusive to the biggest of the big fights. I don't even view this as a bigger or better fight than this week's fight between Shakur Stevenson and Edwin De Los Santos or Emmanuel Navarrete and Robson Conceição. The level of intrigue is about the same. And neither David Benavidez or Demetrius Andrade have so big a following that it warrants sticking this behind a paywall. You hear about greedy promoters and greedy networks all the time in the sport of boxing, but what about greedy fighters? It was Eddie Hearn that stated, I talk about the commercial value of a fighter, and you're talking about a guy who boxed once in 2021, twice in 2022, and once in 2023, all because he has unrealistic expectations of his commercial value. Eddie Hearn said this in reference to Teofimo Lopez, but it doesn't just apply to Teofimo. It applies to a lot of fighters. How many fights that were supposed to happen didn't? How many fights fell apart because one side wanted too much money? Remember, Frank Martin was supposed to be fighting Shakur Stevenson, but apparently a million dollars was not enough for Frank. And bear in mind, Frank doesn't make anywhere near that kind of money. This guy walked away from a million dollars, which he doesn't make per fight. He walked away from a million dollars in a title shot so that he could do absolutely nothing. Box absolutely no one. And this is what the American boxing scene more than some others, this is what it has become. That when you see fights like Benavidez versus Andre on pay-per-view when they really don't belong there, it has more to do with the fighters and their managers' greed than an actual demand for the fight a demand on the ground from the fans. If it were there, I could see. You could get more eyes on this fight if it weren't a pay-per-view, if it were on, say, regular Showtime. The problem is, if it's on regular Showtime, well, you can only spend but so much on it. You can only do it at a certain price. So in pursuit of a bit more money, they stick it behind a paywall, less people see it, less people talk about it, and the fighters' profiles, they don't really go anywhere. And if this, happens enough with enough fights and enough fighters the audience that consumes boxing it starts to shrink that is at least in part what's happening in the american boxing scene too many entitlements too many inflated purse demands too many egos and far too many pay-per-views good number of which are all coming from the same outfit as nobody in the sport of boxing, not Matchroom, not Top Rank, not Golden Boy, not Queensbury, not Boxer, not nobody, is staging quite as many pay-per-views in sequence as the PBC. Thus, it's no coincidence they drove Showtime Boxing into the ground with these practices. It's no coincidence that Fox decided not to renew. It's no coincidence that neither did Showtime. You can't keep your guys in line. You've got a bunch of guys think they're supposed to get an arm and a leg every time they get out there. And granted, while it's not just your fighters, it's not just your guys, it's more noticeable with your guys because everything you put out there is a pay-per-view. Practically. Yeah. I'm gonna buy Benavidez versus Andre, though I'll tell you in a heartbeat. It doesn't belong on pay-per-view, and the numbers for this fight probably won't be much better than the numbers for David's last fight, his last pay-per-view, which did next to nothing. This won't either. And finally, as it pertains to the big heavyweight card that the Saudis are planning for December 23rd, rumor has it that Daniel Dubois, who's on the bounce, on the rebound, off that loss to Oleksandr Yusik earlier this year, he may end up facing America's own Jarrell Big Gravy Miller. And I have a few passing thoughts. If they're gonna let Jarrell Miller participate, He's got to be on his best behavior in that region of the world he does. He may have history with Anthony Joshua, who's supposed to be on the same card. He may have history with Deontay Wilder. But you don't go to that region of the world. You don't get invited to fight and participate on this thing and go play in bad boy in Saudi Arabia. You've got to be on your best behavior over there. That's not the United Kingdom or the United States. got to compose himself and keep himself on a muzzle. You don't go over there playing bad boy. You might end up in some shit for it. As far as the Dubois fight, I like the fight. You could argue Daniel's younger, he's got better and bigger physical dimensions than Jarrell Miller in terms of movement, range of motion, and athleticism. You could even argue that he's a more explosive puncher, punch for punch, than Jarrell Big Baby Miller. You could make those arguments, but the one thing he doesn't have, what he's missing, is heart. He ain't got dog in him like Jarrell Big Gravy Miller. 
Big Gravy is a mid-range to inside pressure fighter volume puncher. He ain't got one hit or quitter power per se. He batters his opponents into submission via accumulation, throwing punches and bunches, combinations. It's intriguing. And it's intriguing not because of how great Jarrell Miller is, but because of how great Daniel Dubois isn't. That he's got some of the right ingredients, the right tools, but he's missing a key component. He ain't got no dog in him. What he does have is quit. So as Jarrell Miller is barreling forward, tucked behind a guard, putting punches together and putting pressure on Daniel, what happens? Does Daniel get in with a good one and take him out? Or does Jarrell Miller overwhelm him? Because he has been active, he's been busy, and he's still an unbeaten fighter. He hasn't lost yet. If Daniel can take his O and take him out, that's a nice feather in Daniel Dubois' cap. That's a nice way to rebound off that disgraceful loss to Oleksandr Yusik, where many people feel Daniel quit. Not necessarily saying that you yourself may feel that way, just that some people do, and that's what some people were saying immediately after the fight. Now, Jarrell Miller, and when it comes to Jarrell Miller, his quality of competition really isn't great. You could argue that Daniel's quality of competition is actually better than Jarrell's, with the disconnect being that even though Daniel fought better fighters than Jarrell did, he didn't beat any of them. He didn't beat Joe Joyce. He didn't beat Oleksandr Yusik. And those are the two best guys that he fought. And you saw what he went through, the blown up cruiserweight in Kevin Lorena. That if Kevin Lorena can make you go through the gears, could Jarrell Miller do a little better? For Jarrell Miller, it would be one of the bigger wins, if not the biggest win of his career? So what does it say about his career, his career so far, that the biggest win of it would be Daniel Dubois coming off a loss? I told you that they would only be able to keep Jarrell Miller out but for so long, because in spite of Jarrell Miller testing positive on two separate occasions for multiple banned substance, he's far from the only guy that tested positive for something more than once. Bermain Stavern tested positive. Luis Ortiz, Lucas Brown, Alexander Povetkin, these guys tested positive for banned substances more than once, and they were allowed to resume their careers. So the same would be true for Jarrell Miller, whether people like it or not. Being honest with you, I'd be lying to you if I told you that I didn't think Jarrell Miller makes today's heavyweight landscape interesting. He's a bad boy with a big mouth, talks a lot of fucking shit, and I would be interested in seeing somebody close it or seeing him beat somebody else. He's catching Daniel Dubois on a bounce. And if he beats him, I wouldn't mind seeing Jarrell Miller in there with Joe Joyce. I could go for that at some point next year. If Jarrell takes care of business with Daniel, I could see a Joyce fight materializing. And you say that, well, that would be a tough sequence of fights for Jarrell, wouldn't you say? But Jarrell's in no position to haggle. Beggars can't be choosy. This could be your ticket back to the forefront of the heavyweight division. If you want to get there, you got to do the work. Matchroom isn't going to touch you. Neither is top rank. The PBC have got their own problems and Golden Boy Promotions doesn't have much use for a heavyweight. They don't really promote heavyweight boxing. So if the people in Saudi were willing to put together that sequence of fights for Jarrell Miller, that's a chance for him to make a splash, make some money, and make some noise. So let's see what happens. Let's see if Dubois versus Miller materializes and let's see if Jarrell can make the most of it.